The Split Rock Lighthouse in Minnesota is the subject of our next episode of Painting and Travel. Sarah talks to the lighthouse keeper about the building's history, while back in the studio, Roger paints the magnificent structure using acrylics. Minnesota is the state of 10,000 lakes, and the biggest one, of course, is Lake Superior, just behind me. And if you have a big lake and you have a shipping industry, you need a lighthouse. That's Split Rock Lighthouse. This is an historical site, and we'll have a chance to look around. Meanwhile, I think Roger knows just what he wants to paint. Split Rock Lighthouse. This is the view I want to paint, but there's 170 steps to get down here, and to bring all our equipment here is a bit too much. So I have my sketchbook. I'm going to do a few sketches, take some reference photographs, and we'll go back into the studio and I'll do a painting there. Split Rock Lighthouse Cleaning Room. This is Ben Peters and he's going to show us around here. Now this room was for cleaning supplies? Correct. And what did they have in the past to clean the lens with? Because I know it has to be very shiny and bright to be able to reflect. Also correct. And they had to clean it every day. Um, it's funny, they actually used a mixture of just vinegar and water. Very similar to what water. we use today. Yes. Back in 1909 or 1910 when this was built, I'm imagining that there were no easy roads here. The, no. The access was from Lake Superior. Correct, yes. And we're on a cliff. 130 so feet. how did they get up here? Well, the men actually landed at the beach just below the station, and on, on the beach they unloaded what's called a hoist and derrick, which is essentially a crane. And they unwound all of the cable on this crane, tied it to a tree about halfway up the hill, and had the crane pull itself up. And they had to do this roly-poly method all the way to over to what we call the hoist and derrick set, which is on the other side of the property, and that's on a 100-foot cliff. And using this hoist and derrick set, they held up their 310 tons of building supplies. I was wondering if they um, cut down some trees in the area to build some of the buildings? No, actually, there weren't a lot of trees up here. Back in 1908, the year before they started constructing here, there was a terrible forest fire that really left this just a barren rock. I see, so the view was spectacular, mm -hmm. but there were no, no shade. Correct, yep. And I see that um, there's a wood pile here, uh, there's a little stove. Does that help you get through the winters? During, the, during now that uh, we're historic site, yes. Uh, originally they wouldn't have had this in here. Uh, they couldn't have had this in here. Problem being, uh, if it's warmer in the building than it is outside, it's gonna fog up the window that goes around the lens and that's gonna affect how the light shines. I never thought about that. So you really have to dress warmly and just hope for the best. Yep. No heat. Yep. I'd like to go upstairs and take a look at the lens up close. Absolutely. Um, I guess it's through here? Right through here, yes. And now how many stairs? Up 32. Okay, that's, 32 steps. that's much less than the 171 steps from the base of the beach down there up here. It, it's, it's a little easier. We call this our short lighthouse for beginners. Okay, good. This is a clockwork mechanism. I don't really know how it works, but I do know what it does. It turns the light. Exactly, yes. And this is made of brass? Yep, brass with a steel cable. And attached to that cable is a 200 pound stack of weights that are falling down the middle of the tower. As those weights fall, they pull the clockworks that keep this lens on its proper rotation. It's exactly like a cuckoo clock. And this is powered by? We wind it up every hour and a half to two hours. In what order lens is this? This is a third order bivalve Fresnel lens. Third order, talking about how big it is, is about six feet around, or excuse me, across. Yeah, it's a bivalve because it's kind of like a clamshell shape, and a Fresnel being named for the way it's built. It's that series of glass prisms that'll focus that light into a beam. Why did they choose the clamshell shape for this? 
White House? Largely for the pattern. Uh, bearing stations had two purposes, of course. There's the warning. It could also give you your, your, uh, your navigational aid. If you're lost in the lake, you can look at the pattern of the light and know where you were. So here, a bivalve lens is going to give you an equal pattern. Our lens spins around once, or a, a full rotation every 20 seconds. You'll get a flash every 10 seconds. A flash every 10 seconds. Yes. So if you're trying to get your barge, your big ship upriver to get some iron ore, then you're really counting on seeing this. Yes, absolutely. Back here in the studio, I was going to paint the lighthouse from the sketch I did down on the beach, which was very dramatic. But as I went through my photographs, I chose this picture instead. And this is what I'm going to paint today. It just has a very nice look about it. I'm using stretched canvas, linen canvas. This is 18 by 24 inches. And I've toned it with a bit of burnt sienna on here to get rid of that white. And I have my drawing already on there to save a bit of time. I'm using quite a few colors today. And on my palette, I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, alizarin crimson, cadmium red light, transparent Indian yellow, cadmium yellow light, chromium oxide green, and olive green, sap green, burnt sienna, burnt umber, and yellow ochre. I think I'll start by putting in some of my darks, which is usually the case, not always. So I'll make some dark blue here and some green. And just get this a real dark area down here. I'm going to be picking up a lot of colors as I go here uh, just to get a nice variation of darks down here. I don't want to use just one or two colors and I don't even necessarily have to mix them on my palette. I can grab them here on the palette and just put them right on the painting. Some of this burnt sienna may show through to give it a bit of warmth. I'm going to vary these colors here, but I'm going to keep them all very dark. These are acrylics I'm using here, so they're going to dry very fast and I'll be able to go over them in just a matter of a few minutes with, with more tones and more colors. You can see some of this burnt sienna showing through in, in little areas. Now, if I hadn't toned the board, that would have been white showing through. Now, I drew the lighthouse very accurately here, but the plants, I just indicated them. And of course, I'm losing most of that drawing now. And that's one reason I didn't put in much detail when it comes to the drawing on these plants and flowers. I've got a spray bottle here, and I use this very frequently to spray my paints and to spray my painting. I think I'll stay with the darks here for a bit more. I'm picking up some ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson. And that's going to give me a very dark purple color here, almost black. And that's this will be the lantern room, the color for the lantern room. Ultramarine blue, some cerulean blue. That's some very bright water down here. Oh, that's too bright. I think I'll add a bit of burnt umber to that. Lighter parts of the painting always need to be applied heavier than darker parts of the painting. So areas like this sky, I'm going to put in quite a bit more paint on the canvas than I would in these dark areas. It just looks better as a painting to do that. And I'll lather this on here. Now down here at the horizon, I'm going to make it lighter and a bit warmer. So I'm mixing some yellow ochre with that. Just putting that on there quite thick. You know, I can spray this with my atomizer. And if I want to blend that out more, I can do so. That water will help to let this paint spread out some and let these brush strokes blend together some. I can't, can't wait for very long because this acrylic will be dry really in no time. I guess that should do the sky pretty much. Let's go over here and fill in a little more sky on the left side of the painting. Okay, with some burnt sienna, a bit of yellow ochre mixed with the blue I have on the palette that I use for the sky, I'll touch in this shadow side of the lighthouse. Here again, I'm going to let some of this burnt sienna show through so it will maintain that nice warmth. And I'm just painting around my pencil lines. This lower part of the lighthouse is a lighter concrete than up in here. 
Okay, mix some of the burnt sienna, yellow ochre again, and some cerulean blue. Get the lighter side of the lighthouse. Maybe a touch of yellow in there. Yeah, let's try that. Ooh, cadmium yellow light. Burnt umber, ultramarine blue and white. This is the light side of this lantern room. There's no glass on this side because this faces the, the land. One reason the lighthouses were blocked on this side was because the uh, Fresnel lens uh, act like a magnifying glass and uh, during the day if the sunlight was coming this way uh, and the lens was sitting there it could actually start a fire, a forest fire, or start the woods on fire with the sun coming through the lantern and magnifying areas just like you did when you were a little kid with a magnifying glass. So that's the one reason they had this blocked from the land side. Okay, well, there, that's quick work of blocking in the whole painting. I can get a smaller brush now and uh, put in a few of these windows. I'm referencing my photograph as I go along here. Pretty frequently, I'm always glancing over at it. Another window right up here at the top. Well, it's only been a few minutes, but these acrylics are quite dry, a little bit tacky, but uh, dry enough so I can work over them now with the second layer of paint here. So now I'm going to start with my greens. I've got my real darks in here, and now I'll start to put in some of the lights. Just start building from dark to light. Probably use the edge of my brush. A lot of the uh, foliage back here in the distance does not need to be very descriptive, so a lot of and a rough brushwork will do just fine, I think. Now, if I were to put too much detail back here in this middle ground foliage, uh, I would have problems with the foreground foliage. I want this to be very soft, sort of indistinct. And then when I put these flowers in and the leaves here, they'll be nice and sharp, and there'll be a contrast between those areas way in the back there and the foreground. It'll make these foreground leaves and flowers stand out. Anyway, that's the, that's the idea. <laughs> Gonna give this a soft edge here. Just using the edge of my brush. Now this is a tree here, and so I need to put some more sky holes in there, some more negative areas. So I guess I'll mix up my sky again with the cerulean blue and white. Now I can touch in a few negative areas and and hopefully start to make this look more like a tree. So right here, I'm using negative areas to create the trunk of the tree. So these negative areas represent the sky, and this right here represents the trunk of the tree. Okay, now I'm going to put in some of these leaves. I think I'll spray my canvas. I guess I'll start with some darker leaves first. So I'll mix up some of this darker green, and just with a flip of the brush, this way and that way, I'll create some of those leaves. I'm taking my alizarin crimson and mixing with the green. Often if you're having trouble with green, put some red in it and you'll get a nice variation to the greens. I guess I'll grab a smaller brush and put in a few of the stems. Another one goes right up here. Maybe we'll just put three of those flowers in there for now. I have to be careful not to cover the canvas with too many of these leaves because I do want some of the background showing through and I don't want to get it too busy either. That's always a possibility, getting things too busy in a painting. I would rather see a painting that has a few things left out and suggest rather than every single detail put in. I kind of like paintings that look like that. And, and again, there's a Personal preference, too. There's nothing wrong with lots and lots of detail. But if the same effect can be done with a few strokes rather than a whole lot of strokes, I think that it makes the painting more effective. I'm going to make this slightly darker right up here because this ridge here, this lip around the lighthouse, is casting a bit of a shadow down here on this part of the lighthouse. And the same thing goes right here. Let's darken that just slightly. Yellow ochre and white. Kind of a bright look right here. It's a highlight that goes right across the top there with a 
sunlight is hitting it. And there's a little bit of a window shade or something up there. Just a stroke or two will do it. Well, I guess before I add too many more leaves and things right here, I'll put in the detail back there of the fence and some of the people that are standing around. And right in here, there's a concrete pad that goes around the lighthouse. And with some cerulean blue, just mixed with that green. Just going to put an indication of these fences that go along here. This is a huge cliff off here. <laughs> I'll scrape off my palette again. And with some warm color and cool color, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, I'm going to indicate a few people standing out here. I think they need to be a little bit lighter because they're off in the distance. And just with a couple of strokes here and there, grab a small brush with my burnt sienna, just put few indications of little heads up there. And maybe this guy is wearing a hat, so we'll put a little bit of a, a brim there. All right, now that I have that in, I can flip up some of my greens into that area. Just take some more of those leaves, flip them up this way, soften that edge right there. Oh, one color I didn't put out on my palette is purple because there are some purple flowers here. Now purple is one of those colors that's very difficult to mix with any other color. So store-bought purples seem to work best. Now you can make a pretty nice purple with alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue, but it just doesn't have the, the nice quality that a manufactured purple does. So that's one of those colors that just seems really hard to mix. I'll start to put in some of these petals of these flowers. I'm going to make them a bit dark the first go around of these petals. And then after I get those, these dark petals in, I'll start putting the, some of the light petals over them. Again, it's just a matter of working from dark to light. These leaves are all dry, so it makes it easy to go over this now, and the purple will not mix with the green. Got another flower going up this way. I'm not following the photograph exactly as I see it, and it's never my intention to copy a photograph. At times I can, can really copy a photograph and it looks pretty good, but I never want to limit myself to the photograph because often things need to be added and more often things need to be left out. Okay, we've got one more flower over here. I'm making these a very sort of a dark, cool, bluish purple color. And where the light is hitting them, that will get warmer. So I'm going to mix my purple here and I'll try and put some alizarin crimson in there and some white. Now that's going to lighten this. Now we have some of our lighter petals on this flower. I'm going to make the stem slightly lighter with some burnt sienna here and yellow ochre. And I'll touch this stem just here and there. I don't want to see that stem go all the way down because it's going to be hidden by some of these petals. So I'll just put it in here and lose it again, find it again. Maybe put a few more stems here and there. You know, there are some little stems coming off of this. So I'm going to indicate them. Right up here is where the glass starts to show. That's where the lens is tucked in, right in behind there. I'll take some of that sky color again, make it slightly lighter, and I'll put the look of the lantern room there. And on top we have the lightning rod, big round ball up there. All right, well now let's get back to this tree up here with some of my warm colors and a few of the cool colors. I'll wipe my brush off just a little and I'm going to scumble some warm tones up here where this tree is. Got so many cool tones down in here, cool greens. I think maybe this tree might do well if it's sort of warm. I'll pick up some greens too and I'll scumble that around to give it a soft edge. Okay, I'm going to have some more foliage going up, kind of covering this area here. 
just using the edge of my brush to give that a nice soft look there. Now the side of this hill is going to be darker than the top because any side like this is not going to catch as much light as it would on the top. So right up here, I'm going to make this green slightly lighter because that's where the sun is hitting it. Just does not hit it on the side of the mountain as much. Well, let me get back to the leaves now. See if I can get some more variation in there and with the color. I think I'll try some warm leaves here, some sort of yellowish colors. On these leaves, I just put my brush down like this and I twist it and that's all it takes. Now this kind of technique can get a little gimmicky, so I don't want to overuse this. It is a good way to make leaves, but I don't want every leaf to look like it was done in this little quick gimmicky way. So I'm careful not to apply too many tricks, as it were, you know? Need to vary these brush strokes here. Got to put some little patches of green here and there. All right, maybe a few bright leaves will help this. So I'll take my cadmium yellow light, some of the Indian yellow, maybe a touch of the chromium oxide green, and put a few very bright leaves here and there. Here is my cadmium red light, along with some purple. I'm going to lighten those petals quite a bit. I think I need more variation in these colors, so I'll take my alizarin crimson and add a bit of variation here. Okay, a dark color, again, ultramarine blue and burnt umber. That's sort of a good standard, ultramarine blue and burnt umber. I've used that a lot over the years, just to make a, a very dark color. I'm going to add a few more stems here and there. And this is a, a bright, but it's a, a new one, and it's got a nice chisel edge to it. So I can just use it on its side like this. I don't have to use a small pointed brush. If I were to use a small pointed brush, it wouldn't hold as much paint, the smaller brush. So a nice brush like this with a chisel point on it, this will hold quite a bit of paint. So I can keep doing this for several strokes and not run out of paint. Now what I'm going to try and do with all these little stems is create kind of a road map for myself where I can make some negative areas in here that will hopefully be interesting. My purpose is not to create a lot of stems it's to give me a guide as to where I might put some negative areas. So I'll do that in just a minute. Now let's mix up a green. I'll take this olive green here. Now right between these stems is an area where I can look at these stems and just paint in between them. And this will create some nice, interesting negative spaces. And by doing it this way, any light green that I put in here has sort of a soft look, sort of a soft rounded look. I, it doesn't give me a hard edge. I have to be careful not to go over everything and do everything the same here because then it would get monotonous again. So I'm just picking up some of my green. Now I'll move over here, do a few more of those negative areas in here. I'll throw in a few more stems here. Just going every which way. Pick up my green again. And I don't know if you can see these little stems very well, but I'm just painting right in between where all those intersect. It just gives it more of a painterly feel, I think. And I don't necessarily have to leave those like that. I can go over these again with a few more leaves. It's back and forth, you know. I'll pick up a bright green. Add a few small leaves here and there in the foreground. And I think a few dark areas between these flowers would be good. Sort of to represent a few little negative areas in, in there as well. Just kind of sharpen this up. Give the impression of a little detail. I just sprayed my canvas and I'm going to work on the tree. I'm going to actually place 
part of the trunk in here. I used a negative area before to create that trunk, but now I'm actually painting in a trunk and a few branches. Titanium white, cerulean blue, touch of my ultramarine blue. It's going to give me the sky color. And we'll put some more of those negative areas in this tree. Try and make it look a little lacy. I think I'll spray that again. By spraying it, it allows the acrylic paints to flow out slightly and give it a soft edge. Now having painted this trunk there, I'm painting around it with the negative areas. And I'm using just a soft touch right on the edge to let the light from the sky kind of flow around the edge of that tree. I want to get a very bright purple now. So I'm going to put quite a bit of white in this, make it kind of a reddish purple, and add a few highlights, little accents right up here at the tops of the flowers. Some yellow, white, cerulean blue, and I'm going to put a highlight right across the top there. Maybe more white in there. Just want to pull the eye over into that area. I'm going to finish this painting by adding some details right here in these flowers. So I'm going to mix this light purple. Now these petals have sort of a little circular look to them. So I'm just going to add that right here, not put too many in. And then with a very light green, I'll add some details to a few of these leaves just to bring them into sharp focus. Well, I think that will finish this painting. Sarah and I enjoyed visiting the Split Rock Lighthouse on Lake Superior. It made a great subject. And if you have your paints out, maybe you'd like to give it a try. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Batsimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.